<laughs> I'll um I'll introduce you both. Let's do that, get the formal stuff out of the way. So Alicia B. Wormsley, foundational to Wormsley's work is the idea of value extraction from the black body and black economic structures. She was raised in and in and around Pittsburgh in um, Pennsylvania and um, Homeward is a site that she returns to often. Collecting discarded ephemera and other found objects on this site and reforming them as artifacts. She is forging a discourse on the shifting anatomy of black neighborhoods. In her ongoing There Are Black People in the Future series, she's in conversation with artists and activists globally around the idea of the black body as an extractive commodity and the pursuit of a new teleological framework for the emergence of black futures. Ramalaika Imhotep is a black feminist writer and performance artist from Atlanta, Georgia, currently pursuing a doctoral degree in African diaspora studies at the University of California, Berkeley, with a designated emphasis in new media. Her academic and creative work tends the relationship between black femininity, Southern vernacular aesthetics, and the performance of labor. She is a co-convener of the Embodied Spiritual Political Education Project, the Church of Black Feminist Thought, and a member of the curatorial collective, The Black Aesthetic. So, so I was thinking today that it, it might be a good idea for us to, um, like to begin with a pause because you know so much has been going on in the past few weeks um, and there have been a mixture of feelings for myself in quiet moments about the police murders of Makia Bryant, Duante Wright, Adam Toledo, Marcus David Peters, Andrew Brown Jr and Anthony J Thompson. From Tennessee to Minnesota this country is in a perpetual state of grieving striving for answers almost as a way of avoiding the dark and unpalatable truth that to be black is to be a non-subject. This collection of films in, in lots of ways is a, a, an attempt to look at how we might consider the black body as a landscape, a place from where we can begin to be both black and part of the land, not in the way that Catherine Yusof um, might see as an extraction, but very much as part of the environment. And here I'm thinking like the tags on the wall, the sounds of bass from a car or the clothesline full of billowing cotton. The spaces we inhabit as black geographies, what are they? Is that an individual interpretation or experience or is it something that we might find in the commons or under commons to borrow from Moton and Harney? And then how do we navigate those spaces? So where, where would you like to start today? <laughs> Ooh. yeah I'm where would I like to start um I I think um I mean I, it's hard to I, it's hard it's hard out here it really is it's hard it's hard to hear in those names yeah um you know, I think like these films were beautiful. What a, a beautiful collection of films, Nan. Thank you for this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, um, I mean, I guess we can start with breath, right? We have it. Mm -hmm. We're grateful for it. Yeah. I feel like so, so many of um, the films were, you know, had this content that was around um, black death, really. You know, in the in a in you know, and I think that not to be I mean, I wouldn't call myself an Afro-pessimist, but I am interested in lots of their ideas um, because I do think that there's this way that we are, you know, not seen as human. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I was listening, re-listening, re um, Fred Moten gave a, 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 was in a 
talk, a discussion with um, Adrian Brown and Theaster Gates, and they were, and the talk was titled Art, Space and Poetics. And, um, you know, he, he talks about this idea of, you know, like the title of this series is Dislocated. Um, and he talks about displacement and dispossession. And here he says, the cost of black sociality that a certain notion of freedom incurs or imposes, all of those things are real questions we have. And to me, this is a part of the reason why again, one has to make a claim upon displacement, to make a claim upon dispossession against the grain of the brutality of acquisition. You know, these are at the heart of our history. That's, that's a quote from him. And I just, you know, I wonder, I'm so in, curious about what you both think about if we actually just, if we claim this, this the non-subject, it's, it's a fact, it's a reality. And instead of, you know, there's a way of kind of looking or acting, you know, as activists and as people involved in political structures or the, the, the arts, et cetera, there's a way that we can respond to these moments and, um, and you know, through our work yeah. by saying that, you know, you, you want change, but actually, what does that actually look like in reality? Yeah. I um, I, I have been having cycles of the same conversation over the past like 48 hours about grief. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like a, a, a theme that I almost wasn't even expecting like to be feeling so heavily, but I guess it makes perfect sense um, through these films is grief. And I wonder about um, like my, uh, like a colleague, comrade, person I organized with here in New Orleans, Ron Reagan said, something the other day, like, you know, like he was just like, I love grief because grief is disabling. It's anti-capitalist. <laughs> it sits you down, it lays you out. It, it, it fogs your brain, like it literally refuses. And, and we were just thinking together, um, myself, Ron Reagan and Aisha Rashid um, about like how we in movement and also I can think about myself in academic space or myself in art space, we, we want to make use of the death and the dying. We wanna make sense of it. Maybe not use all the time, but definitely sense. And like, I just feel some, something opening around like, what if we just let it not make sense? You know, like, what if we just let it disorder us and like really think about like to inhabit non-being or non-subjecthood or however you want to say it um, to be a complete refusal of, of everything. Like, I don't want to make mm -hmm. sense. I don't want to know. I don't want to claim. I don't want nothing. Right. Why non? Like, and I can just be elsewhere. Um, and I don't know, so I, like, it's like, part of that was a confession to say, like, I have felt so disoriented and shattered by a really peculiar, like, it's, it's peculiar because I think part of me expects that, you know, at this stage in the, in the game of late capitalism, like, I, I don't want to be outraged or I don't want to be shocked anymore by the state doing its business. Um, but I think this um, week of complicated feelings and murder on murder on murder kind of and then the and then knowing that there are more names that we don't know and then just like the, the really complicated like all the complicated uh, structures of violence that make themselves present in the tragedy of um, Micaiah Bryant's death is like really disordering. Like my, I can't think about it. I can't think about it enough to figure out <laughs> what its implications are. But I do think that something that I got from the films, particularly I'm thinking about T 
and um, Children of Nan, and really like all of them. There's something about memory, but also something about, you know, that line um, at a, that I wrote down in my phone somewhere, but like when you make something with your hands, it heals you deeper than the places where you cry. Like really this call that I'm feeling about like, how do we actually accept that when we say black death or black dying or whatever, we're, act we're naming grief. And if we sat with the grief and like tend it to the grief and tend it to the healing, like, and whatever that looks like, what if it looks like these fantastic suits? Like, I was sitting here like, I need to make a suit. I need to do a dance. Like, I like, do I dance now? I don't know. Um, but I just, so I'm feeling something around just like, I feel called in by these films and by your question, Nan, to consider different ways of tending to grief and how might it look if I put, if I and then we perhaps put tending to grief before making sense of Black death. Right. I, I totally will, will just um, connect to that because I also, I mean, that, that light outfit is just incredible. <laughs> It was incredible. It, like, you know, like me and my son were both like, oh my God, look at that. Like, that is amazing, you know? And uh, like, how can we make that? But, but those are the things, right? Those are the charges. That's like the connection, right? Who fears death? Um, I think that, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one thing I was thinking about is uh, Trisha Hershey, who is the Nat Bishop. Um, who lives in Atlanta, I think, right? And um, I was just like a huge fan of her work. And, you know, she is like, rest is resistance, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I actually made this film before I found out about her work and, and then somebody recommended her and then, you know, it was the kind of this uh, beautiful thing, but she talks so much. I, I, um, did, I was like, fortunate enough to do one of her workshops, rest workshops, and she really goes through grief. Grief is like a huge part of it. And, and just like as like a way, as a vehicle to imagine what our existence could be, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have, like that's a step, almost like if it was like a 12 step program, like grief is like, like the first thing right, that we have to kind of like move through, even in our dreams, even our ancestors, even for our, you know, like that is just, even for pieces of ourselves that aren't, that feel superficial or insubstantial, like the, those things, everything, we, that's like collectively something that needs to happen, right, and I think these little kind of moments where we have that time to grieve, where we have that space to grieve, I think is really important. I think, um, yeah, cause I, I don't know, like some of the things like this, sometimes I, I think about like the weight of all of this. And then I think about like, I think about that title of the book of, of uh, Who Fears Death. I think about that all the time and like, I just see like this, um, I don't know, I just, I just feel that, I, I feel stuck personally, but I also feel like I, like I have to cry all the time. I feel like I have to mourn. I feel like you know, I, I was raised by two grandmothers, so I have hope. But, but it's intense. And it's those, and it's that movement, it's that meditation, it's that breath, it's that dance, it's that, like all of those things are so necessary. Mm. Right? Um, I've also been thinking a lot about that phrase, like, all I have to do is stay black and die. I've been thinking about that phrase so much. 
And so I, you know, like as, I mean, is that a prayer? Is that like, just like, is that like, cause we know, you know, like all of those things. So I think about, yeah, you know, that's that. But, but you know, I think that you, you're, um, you know, you're speaking about a text that you keep remembering and the text that I keep remembering is your text. There are black people in the future because it's almost, you know, it has all these different, um, emotions that it evokes it's a question it's a statement it's a you know like a gentle kind of utterance it's this beautiful way of reminding us that we are here and we are in the future and and I think about what I, I feel like a lot of the artists a lot of black artists who I love one of the reasons why I love that work is because there's this conflation between the past the present and the future. And I feel like you're doing that in your work, Alicia, you know, certainly in Children of Nan, but there's this, you know, like in tea as well, there's this kind of speculative nature of, you know, this is what, what could this be like? You know, this is what, this is our, this is what our life is like. This is what black life is like. And then we still have joy and we still have, we're still dancing and we're still achieving and still being brilliant. And, and yet we're in this, you know, this hold, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh my God, you know. <laughs> I know, it's intense, it's an intense talk. I mean, I just, I think, you know, we, um, you know, for me, there are Black people in the future was not a question. Yeah. You know, it was just, it is, like I said, I was raised by two grandmothers, you know, who, who are, um, you know, uh, who survived so much in this country. So that, that's like a reality, right? And so they, they knew we were going to be here. So, so I have to say the same thing. I have to like have that same. Um, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm thinking about how like, you know, there's also a thread in the films about memory mm -hmm. and, you know, archives, right? And like, there's this way that like, if, <clears throat> when I think about the film T, um, when I think about even the kind of like, I, and I'm trying to remember, like, I feel like there's just like a loose citation floating around in my head. Or no, even in um, Children and Nan getting a direction from the sanctified church, right? Like there's something about like the fact that like all the, the speculative technologies that allow us to like reclaim ourselves or express ourselves are already here. There are already things we do, like like the the fucking uh, memorial t-shirts and like right. uh, like I I know even if I don't know the stories, I know that my or actually I know this because it was my impulse when um, this time last year when. Corona was just started and I was just like feeling all this creative impulse like I know that that is like ancestral technology like that is like how my folks have responded to vulnerability making right and like mm -hmm. how we've like navigated the like I feel like what is damning is that it never stops it won't stop like the death the dying the grieving won't stop um, but I think like you're saying, like the, the elders in my family and in my orbit and just in the world have survived the, the same deaths, like the same dying. Like, I don't, I don't have the numbers. I'm not really interested in them, but I just had the thought that like, you know, I'm not even sure if statistically there are more, you know, white supremacist murders happening now than there were. Um, in the 1950s or the 20s or before that. But I think what is shifted is our opportunity or opportunity is where we're, but our seeing of them, our sensing of them mm -hmm. 
right. feeling facing them in these like really like intense and broad reaching ways. And I think that there's something even about like, like the spec part of speculative, like seeing and like, I don't know, I, again, like I said, disorient, like I'm all over the place today. <laughs> there's like something about like what does what does seeing enable um or limit you know in terms of like how we can or how we allow ourselves to like um understand the ways that both our liveliness and our dying will endure like stay black and die is such a like stay black which is the right thing, perhaps and die like it's such a deep like <laughs> couplet <laughs> that comes out so quick but it's like both those things will be constant and maybe that is the only truth <laughs> right <laughs> that's real I mean, this is, I mean, it really, what you're saying about like the speculation, the seeing the, right? Like what is, was the first like Rodney King, right? We, we saw that we, we like as a, a large population of people saw that there was witness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, Yeah, I mean, but what is it like the balance of seeing, right? Because they're, they had like, you know, I mean, we're this, this white supremacy, I mean, it is filled and it is like through speculative violence is a main structure in white supremacy, right? Whether we're watching hangings, link, legal hangings, non-legal lynchings, hangings like these those things that is like the history of this people getting shot to death people this like this violence is integral mm -hmm. and it's integral to capitalism mm -hmm. and it's integral you know like it's just so so you know so part of me is like this shit don't have nothing to do with us why why is this even you know like what i it's uh it's and that's like the most frustrating. I think that's the most frustrating part, right? For me, like mm -hmm. this shit don't have nothing to do with us. Like figure that, you know, like we, we can't show you how to be human. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then it takes up so much energy because, you know, like I love that line in um, Christopher Harris's film where he says, um, a memory of a dream of a memory. And like you say, Malika, there's so much about memory in mm -hmm. the films, the, mm -hmm. the absence of it all. Yeah. The vibration and of the, it. The, the sound too in the films is so interesting to me because it's so much connected to memory. Yes. With the sound in all the films. Say, say so, some more. I love, I mean, I just loved it. I felt, you know, just kind of following that soundtrack because there were times you know this is a long program I had to like feed my kids and like <laughs> so I'm listening to the whole you know like to this whole thing I'm watching out of the corner of my eye I'm listening to this this soundtrack of like um of memory of like clips mm -hmm. right of pieces of of cars driving by with music on you know like like it's this this very familiar soundtrack of like you know, these news programs, this, mm -hmm. these people interviews of this, of this, like these, of these songs, these old movies, these, like the ways that we kind of archive information just for ourselves. Like, you know, each one of these filmmakers is the archive, right? Mm -hmm. That is being shared. And, um, and I, I just really love that. Mm -hmm. And it felt really familiar to me. It felt like I, I understood kind of just based on the sound I could I could connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carol's put something in the chat. Yeah. 
Like, yeah. you get for the video? Like, scenario. <laughs> Um, Carol says, I agree, Ra and Alicia. In addition, the line in Children of Nan about the archive being flawed, yet we still watched it, really exemplifies the complexity we face, having to draw on archival documentation slash material that is full of contested, controlling, and violent content, so often documented about us, but not by us. Mm. Right. And it's manipulated, right? Exactly. You know, like I, I make films, I know how easy it is to make a point. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Have it uncontested. Right? Yeah. And so it, it's, um, you know, uh, I think that that's like a really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, you know, that it's, was taught that history is neutral and, you know, anthropology, like all of these, everything. Everything that we study is neutral, but it's so loaded. Right. So. <laughs> neutral. <laughs> Always from the same perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Carol has got a question, maybe a question. Oh, yeah, it is a question. Children of Nan was superb. I agree. Definitely, Carol. Um, thank you, Carol. <laughs> they say, thank you so much for sharing this deeply poignant work. I would be very interested to hear whether filmmaker Alicia B. Wormsley drew inspiration from the work of Alan Gallagher. Brilliant question. Oh it's yeah, I love the uh, watery. Watery aesthetic, yeah. Yeah, that series is, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, and other contemporary fine artists, activists, futurists who have foregrounded Drexia in their creative mm -hmm. aesthetic and scholarly fine art is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, Odalith Group's film Drexia really, um, that with me for a long time. I I really learned about Drexia from Ingrid Lafleur, who's in the film, and um, she is an Afrofuturist from Detroit. And um, she started a collect uh, um, organization project called Afrotopia, and you know has curated, performed you know, created those, the meditation in the film was uh, based from a series of meditations that she had been doing um, in, in an installation of her own black tourmaline sculptures. Mm. Um, and the black tourmaline was, you know, uh, a tool for healing black bodies. And, um, and so, you know, and we worked together just to edit the meditation so it fit the film, uh, but, but she really, uh, told me about Drexia. You know, she's from Detroit. This is like, that's Detroit. So, um, so yeah. So I, it took you know, like I had seen certain things and I knew about them, but I didn't know like how brilliant, how much, um, how much they meant to electronic music in Detroit and the entire world, the genre, mm -hmm. and um, and I didn't. Um, you know, really know the extent of like, of that, of the like existence of Drexia um, in kind of uh, uh, Afrofuturist um, right. understanding and whatnot until, until I uh, really talked, had a lot of conversations with In Ingrid about it. Um, but I immediately like was just moved at how, you know, these two young men could could take something so atrocious and turn it into this, like, into a world. Yeah. And that is like a kind of at the height of like this film, like really inspired this film of of me, like taking all these like atrocities of through that I've seen growing up and like all the ways that I've been conditioned, you know, I studied anthropology at Cal. I, you know, like I, all the ways in which I've been, of uh, like witnessed this violence. Yeah. And so I just, you know, um, I'm so thankful to them. I wonder as well if you, you know, while we're talking about your work, Alicia, if, um if you could say something about, um, like, I feel like, I feel like it's really interesting. It was, 
I think it was quite <clears throat> a good idea, if I say so myself, but to, have, <laughs> to start with still here and then to end with children of Nam because I feel like in so many ways they're in conversation with each other. Oh, um, yeah. Like, you know, the movement on the streets and the, um, uh, the buildings that are, you know, vacated. Um, I wonder if you could speak to like your gathering of resources. There were so many of those kind of like detritus in, in, in still here. And it was making me think about you and how you gather these objects, you know, you have gathered these objects in Homewood um, and then created, you know, turn, reified them and um, given them this different kind of life. Again, you know, keeping us here, um, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, it made me think also about um, Alyssa Blount Moorhead's work, you know, um, as of a now, where she's, um, you know, there's, again, it's this kind of like physical erasure of, of blackness from, from an area. And how do you, like one of the questions she asks is how can stories that are attached to objects and now vacant buildings live beyond the loss of their material vessels. I feel like you could, you know, your work is really speaking to that question. Yeah, um, well, definitely this uh, Homewood is a neighborhood in Pittsburgh um, that I lived when I was a kid and I moved a lot, um, you know, uh, around Pittsburgh. I, all in Pittsburgh, but we moved a lot, maybe like every two years. And I, Homewood, we lived there. And then, um, you know, probably the longest I can remember we lived um, right kind of, I mean, we lived now the border has gotten smaller because of gentrification. So technically where I grew up is called Point Breeze, but it was Homewood when I was a kid. And, um, and we moved because there started to be like um, some survival violence, some gang violence that was happening. And a policeman came to our door and saying they look were looking for someone that looked like my brother and we moved like a week later you know my mom was like no that's not we're not doing that you know just even thinking about like my mom having that uh ability right because a lot of people wouldn't move because of that right like that like my mom was just like nope this is not you know and that was a part of her spirit like of course us moving but Anyway, so, but Homewood, we always spent time there. Like, even when we moved out, my mom ran some programs, youth programs. She was a Delta and they had like parties in this one place where I went roller skating. And, and so, um, so I just, I, I, I felt so connected there. And I was always taught this legacy of Homewood and like all the people who are from Homewood and, and how, um, you know, and like we would walk around and my mom would say, you know, when I was a kid, these, there were houses everywhere here mm -hmm. like this these were all you know and she'd tell us about people and you know and here's the the original opera house is the first black opera in america right is in homewood and things like that you know so so which is why there's opera in the film um and so the you know those things are 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 uh kind of the impetus when i moved back to pittsburgh and i was working on these experimental films um with children of nan that that first like six minutes i made in t like 2010 it was like one of the first films i ever made and i made it mostly because i wanted to make a film like chris marker like mm -hmm. legetti mm -hmm. and i just was like i'm gonna make this i have this idea and i'm just gonna use images i already have and i'm not i'm not gonna shoot anything the only thing i shot was like that that hand grabbing the other hand that was the only thing i shot for that first part and um and I was there and I just started, uh, I was working with kids. I had a residency with the Andy Warhol Museum and I, I, uh, they put me in a classroom in, in a school in Homewood because I said I wanted to work in that neighborhood. And I worked with kids and they, um, you know, they, they would just talk about, they wanted to make zombie films and how perfect Homewood was because it looked like an apocalypse, right? This is the neighborhood we live in, right? And I am just thinking about all these brilliant things, this like legacy that I was taught. And I would take them on these same walks my mom took me on and like, you know, and put them to sleep <laughs> telling them these things. And, and like, and they, you know, and, and while they were making their zombie films, I just started collecting objects and 
part of it was like ritual part of it's like real witchy like this just who I am and then another part of it was like the sci-fi aspects which is like also when I was a kid time bandits was one of my favorite movies and like there's this objects that you hold like a, a pocket watch or something and it takes you through time like you can go through dimensions and like and I think about those with the objects like these objects have this power that and not only that but like our the DNA of the people who use them is on these objects mm -hmm. right so that so they are like these you know their technology right even if it's a wrapper or like these cigarette butts or an old iPhone that got ran over by a car or you know all of these objects that I just found on the street they have like this they're they're rich they have this this technology they have the ability to travel through time you know and so I wanted to like hold them and and um and archive them right like I I, I make my own archive yes right like I have that power right yeah like raw Right. I have, I had your book, like, right. It's downstairs. I was sitting downstairs earlier and I was going to be like, here's your book right here. But like, you know, we get to make our own archives. We have to be in charge of that. Absolutely. As you were talking, I was thinking of, um, I want to say it's one of the first lines in the, in the still here film where they're talking about the bricks and like every brick you see was put there by a hand. Right. And, and as soon as I heard it, I started thinking about the ways that like, um, you know, embodied histories, black histories, black labor histories are literally in the landscape everywhere. But in another sense, as I hear you talk about these objects, I'm thinking about like, you know, the, the history in the phone, right, that was held and dropped and discarded and left behind, you know what I'm saying? Or like, just the ways that there are so many like when you when you conjure up the this idea of an abandoned space or a space where black people used to be um there's often this this like you know uh, image of either like ruins or streets littered with trash like the look and feel of dispossession has something to do with like items everywhere or like items not in their proper place or even maybe I'm thinking about like evictions like walking mm -hmm. by on the street but like thinking about how alive and full those objects are um, how much they hold and how much they tell um, is really like that's just something that's perking up for me um, yeah and it makes me really curious about it makes me curious about, I don't know, just how we think of, how we think of ruin in relationship to blackness or how we think of like, kind of like the mess of dispossession, like the literal, like tangible light. Blight, that's the word, literally. I hate that word. <laughs> the word that they be using. Right? <laughs> Like, but what, what would, it, and I think Afrofuturism or speculative fiction or all the, those things, that genre of like thinking future-minded or extraterrestrial, there were also lots of planets in these films. Like, <laughs> but I think that is a lens that allows us to like see and imagine the life in, in blight or in detritus or in trash. You know, like it gives us a, a new tool set to like, to make, to breathe it, life into it, like to make it zombies, like now I'm like zombie trash. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, like with Flaneuse as well, you know, the, the background to it is, you know, really thinking about like what Agne Varda does in, in the Gleaners where, you know, it's, there's this divide that Baudelaire has created between um, the flaneur and the rag picker. So the, there are these two groups who are on the street, but there's this distinct, you know, class difference between them. And and the rag picker is kind of like looked frowned upon. Um, and I feel like Agnivada is kind of elevating them. And I, you know, um, that that's all <laughs> I wanted to say about that. But <laughs> I think it's interesting, you know, when we're thinking about trash and the people who are 
well, you know, for some people, like they say, some people's trash is somebody else's treasure, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I love that. Like, even when you, when you first shared with me that you were thinking about the flanoose and like thinking about feet it, or feet, that was a really weird way to say it, but you know, <laughs> feet is a like <laughs> So anyway. Um, it, it was sparking all these things because I had been thinking about um, just the ways that, like you're saying, this distinction between maybe, it's, and this is something that is really loud in New Orleans, but like the distinction between people who work in the streets and people who stroll the streets leisurely, you know, like I just was by a museum in the French Quarter today, and it's always been this way. It's super trippy in a pandemic. But you can literally see like in the like choreography in the body posture of like black folks working the quarter, whether they're working it as like um, literal laborers, like cleaning up, like uh, I don't know what you call like a like a janitor in the street, but like people who are stewarding the streets of the French Quarter or people who are busking, people who are whatever, you can almost even see in the body posture, just like a, I don't know, it's just such a, a clear demarcation that's made between those who, who put their feet to the pavement regularly for, for work or for the chance to gain some income um, versus folks who are there, you know, just dripping daiquiris all over the place, you know what I'm saying? And I think that there's something like in, um, I see with you, uh, Nan, like this, this desire to like think differently about the flanous or think differently about like what we, what can be meant when we think of this character that is in the streets? Like, what if we mm -hmm. held those laboring women, working women, um, working folks, like into this category of the, of worldliness? Cause they are, they see that it's the same street. So they're seeing the same things, probably even seeing more, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. you know, it's not an aloof looking, like it's a really grounded um, traversing. Mm. That reminds me as well of, um, I went to see the David Hammond show and I think he hadn't had a show in, in LA. It was at Hauser and Worth for something like 35 years. And, you know, I went in there and it was like highly, I had like a highly emotional response, like so much joy and so much grief and just a lot of emotions. And, and I came out and then one of the people who, the one, the custodians said, oh, you know, what, what did you think? And it was, all of the custodians were um, black and brown men, mostly, mostly black men. And it was an older black man. And he was like, he just told me so much about the exhibition that I did not see. He was like, did you see the, the pyramid that was cast on the floor? And I was like, no, there was so much that it was just brilliant. And I think that, you know, often the people who are being elevated are the curators or the you know, the director and everything, but there are the, all these people who are on the ground who were seeing this work, you know, for hours on end and really yeah. have completely different interpretation or a truer interpretation of, of the, you know, the artist's vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, they have like mu much more knowledge. <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, all the time, anytime I do something in, a, in an institutional building, I'm, I always, asked like the people who are working on the floor right what's going on yeah what's the tea <laughs> what's the tea like what's, how's this going right yeah um yeah it's like such a it's a you know because they because not only like are they on the ground but they live in that city right right they live in that space like they know like who's who's coming in there they know they know it all it's it's really kind of the best way to get to understand what's happening mm -hmm. um yeah we have a, a couple more points um rem this is, this is actually my partner he says i really enjoyed this afternoon thank you i'm a big detroit techno fan and drexia always struck me as a reinvigoration of memory they created their own story from the strands of truth to use the middle passage as a site of the ultimate resistance the seizing of power 
and reinvention of self. Drexia embraced death to reconstruct the world, which I always found fascinating, and that they did this in Detroit makes it even more re um, resonant. I'm so glad you highlighted them. Yeah. Yeah. And just amazing. Did you see uh, Jen Nakiri's film? Uh, just if you haven't, uh, Jen Nakiri, uh, maybe I'm saying that wrong, but uh, she she made a film about the, uh, it's called Black Techno. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jen and Kuru, is it? Is it Jen and Kurt? Okay, sorry. Yeah. No, no, so I've never heard her name said. I <laughs> just read it in my <laughs> poor language. Um, but I, it's an incredible, I mean, all of her films are incredible, but Black Turn Film is really like special. Mm -hmm. okay. British, British filmmaker, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really struck by this line, like Drexia embraced death to reconstruct the world. And I feel like that is everything I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I think that there's like obviously a way to challenge death. There's a way to like fight it, if you will. But I'm I'm really feeling moved um, mm -hmm. in general, and I think especially after this like cocktail of films to think of <laughs> how, how might how might we how might I embrace death to reconstruct the world right allow, and allow grief to reorder me yeah mm. Mm -hmm. got some some more comments um Anne Walsh a friend I'm appreciating so much this convo began, conversation began with the deep acknowledgement of grief and Ra's mentioning it as a form of refusal and the way you are moving and holding that grief as a piece of recovery, legacy, joy, and fantasy. Thank you. Lucasa, not a friend. I love that, that person and got to chat with him too. <laughs> Who's this? Oh, she's talking to somebody else. No, yeah. and the David Hammonds. Oh, David Hammonds. Oh, yeah, yeah. I oh. think that's, I think, am I right? Is that the reference? Must be, yeah. Lukeza? The true, oh, the guy, the same guy, right? The true guide of that show, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, who are the folks who keep the histories of our space and neighborhoods and how do we center them always, yeah. Um, Erin, another friend, thanks Erin. Thank you so much for gathering, archiving, making and sharing. Really, it was really brilliant to get together with you both and, and talk through these films and yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should have like our own TV show. And just <laughs> just <Hello. chat. laughs> I just wanted to say quickly that just because it, it randomly came into my head, but the way I taught my my students at, at Cal, they're like freshmen in a writing class, what an archive was was literally like, you know how people like, like, well, when I talk to them about how like they or maybe their parents keep all their old writing, like perhaps and how that's an archive. But then I literally started talking about trash. Like I was literally like, you know, so one man's trash is another man's treasure or just thinking about like how, I feel like it's so important to, to think about and raise up the ways like the the person who in the in the film who had a collection of, RIP t-shirts and was like pulling them out of cooler and mm -hmm. like archives, right? Yeah. Like, and that like I could I could start I got archives of many different genres <laughs> all around. Right? Got books, got ephemera, all of it, you know, and I think that is it feels really significant. Um it's something I feel like archiving is a really big part of the practice of black life um, and I'm, I'm appreciating how these films brought perk that up to the surface and how that is different than the archiving impulses of anthropology archaeology right. colonialism right. right 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 and it's a way of resisting as well right it's a way of um you know by archiving what you know by choice it's a way of making resistance to to these kind of formal, you know, right. uh, institutional ways that uh, have been gathered because, you know, <laughs> you know, hundreds of years ago, we were also collected as well. So, you know, right. it's important for us to like break that tradition right. and rethink it. 
Well, and who sees it too, right? So, you know, all of those things, like when, you know, when I was wa- wa- watching these anthropological films, just like Chase film, right? The, you see these th- this footage and you're like, what the fuck is going on? You know, like you immediately are like, no. <laughs> no, I remember just like having these moments in class being like, no, no, this is not okay. <laughs> This is not, you know, like, or like reading books, like I was telling my students, right? Like we share, we, I had them read from this like older um, book about um, Negro folklore written by a, a white anthropologist. And I'm like, how do we, how do we find the information in here that is needed? Mm-hmm. How do we know what to, right? What, what we keep, what do we keep and what do we just skim through? Right, like how do we, you know, like how do we decipher? And, and it's and usually, it usually has quotes <laughs> on one side or the other, or, you know, like it's usually like this, something that's disregarded. Right. Right, that's just like a footnote. Mm-hmm. That's usually where the truth is in these texts. You know, so I just, it's just like, you know, again, coming into that speculation that like seeing, right? Who sees it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know, I was just like, I just like, I'm like, that's such a brilliant assignment. (laughs) That is. I know that Carol's left because she was she's in London, um, so it's obviously super late there. But um, her first point was um, talking about Catherine McKittrick's text, Demonic Grounds, um, and where McKittrick quotes Sylvia Winter, obviously the goddess, at length when identifying certain raced and marginal spaces in the West as poverty archipelagos. Um, it's interesting to consider whether Christopher Harris was documenting uninhabited sites in St. Louis's aging built environment as representations of poverty archipelagos with the deteriorating landscapes replacing and representing absent human bodies. Those absences to a large extent of any raced bodies within the scenes of still here encouraged me uh, and perhaps others too to inscribe my own imagined narratives about race and place onto the remnants of that urban landscape. Oh, Carol's still here, y'all. Carol is still here. I know. Carol's holding it down. Like it over two, two a.m. or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um. What else? Laurel says, thinking about the Ted Chang story, the truth of fact, the truth of feeling. That's the thing too, is like what, I mean, like just all of these, these like decisions, mm-hmm. right? Like are, are, are fact and feeling different? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like any, I mean, I just, th- I'm just thinking, I've been thinking a lot about li- the limitations that we exist in, right? We think of language of the English language, yeah. of the, of like text, of how we, you know, like what's determined, right. um, what science is, what is, you know, like all these, these, all the limitations mm-hmm. um, that make, that kind of make uh, white supremacy a religion. Ooh. Right? Right now, right. It's a belief system. Mm-hmm. Well, but it's seen as fact though, right? That 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 uses the term fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I'm you made up to, that word. That's so <laughs> I'm trying to put the quote together, but I definitely heard Sadia Hartman say one time that like a fact is a statement endorsed by the state. Like that's yeah. all a fact is. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's literally it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you're right when we when you when you 
do away with fact, you see, oh, these are strongly held beliefs mm -hmm. that people are fanatic about. Like it, it literally gets there. Like it does yeah. get it's a premise. That supports system. Yeah. Right? A, a failing system. And that's what's so beautiful about your work, Alicia. And I feel like with Che Applewaite as well, you know, like think rethinking the archive and looking at it, telling these, you know, and then creating it in the same way that Sadia Hartman is like, I'm going to tell this, this is history, mm -hmm. you know, because all of the history books are just, you know, from this very personal perspective, it's just that we're not told that it's from a personal perspective. And that's like a, you know, a, a queer and a feminist, um, you know, way of do, doing research and a way of writing is by saying, you know, by putting yourself in, in the story and saying, this is, I'm doing this from this standpoint because of this, for mm -hmm. this purpose. Whereas, you know, these other textbooks are, you know, it's, this, is, this is history. This is what we're right. really thinking, like it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think, oh. go ahead. Oh, Jesus, now I'm like, whoa, where was I going? <laughs> um, but no, just on that, like Hartman and critical tabulation, which I think, you know, for more and more, like the term, like Afrofuturism doesn't seem to hold everything I'm trying to make it do. Uh, so. But there's something about like, I do think the Hartman critical fabulation, this idea of like creative critical expression of like sensing or like sensual language, writing from the body, which I feel like is like a big part of that method is to say like where the archive just wants us to take cold facts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep these facts through my body and say, well, if this line says that somebody was punished in this heinous way, I'm going to think about how that line would impact my body and write the story with that embodied knowledge. And like, I don't know, there's something like about that decision to collapse the distance between like the writing self and the the, the, the history you're encountering or the paper you're encountering or the archive you're encountering that is like mystic to me. Like it's mm -hmm. really like, it's, it's witchy. It's like, it's, uh, it's just different. It's otherworldly. And I, I'm really excited that, I'm just really glad that that is, ha like that type of methodology, like an embodied methodology um, which I think definitely comes up in the work of the filmmakers. I even, I had a question for both of you really about like what, like how, what was y'all's experience of like living with those stories in your body? Like if it was about, like, I think, yeah, that, that was the question in my head. Like as filmmakers, like what is it like living with those stories in your body, in your brain, in your mind um, as you work through them? Um, and I just, I'm really curious about the ways that like, um, that like a, that distance is collapsed between like the sterile archive and the like present moment. Like where it's like, no, actually we're gonna be in all the places at one time. Like most of, like everything is together here <laughs> now, which it is, right? Like it very much is, but I love that as a message. Well, um, I can, you know, when I uh, made this film, it was, um, I made it from an archive. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't shoot a lot for this, specifically for this film. I had a lot of footage from other projects, from experiments, from, um, other things from, you know, found footage I collected or um, all of those things. And I kind of, uh, I, the impetus of making this film was because I had, you know, cause I became a mother and it was kind of the first time I ever really felt like a woman, you know, um, I always identified 
as a black person, but I definitely had like issues with my gender and, and there were um, of like, you know, and it was like this one thing like, and it made me feel more connected to my mom and my grandparents, my grandmothers and like this kind of legacy that, that I hadn't felt before. Cause I'd always been this like very free spirit and, you know, kind of like, you know, free with gender, with my own gender and free with like all the, you know, like I just had this, but there was like something really um, heavy in my body, like, right? Like I, I, you know, like gave birth at this, this part of my body was like in my arms, you know? And, um, and I just like had all these kind of visions, like, and all these things. And I, and it, and it felt so intense and it felt like I had to, to work through it in some way. And, you know, and like, that's what artists do, right? <laughs> we like, you know, like I didn't really have time to go to therapy. So I made this film <laughs> and, and, it, you know, and it was just like, kind of like this. And I started looking through my hard drives and like looking through all the things that I collected or bookmarked or just like that, like that just resonated with me because of something like, you know, and a lot of it was, I mean, I had, you know, that whole chapter where it's like um, films from with black women and white men, you know, I, I wanted to make this series of memes. I'm like, a, I love memes. I think they're like the, like the best, like, black memes is like a whole world. And I was gonna, you know, I had like been bookmarking those kind of in this space. And I, because I was just processing like, oh my God, these are films I watch, you know, that were on the TV in my grandmother's house that were like just playing like in the background, like, or, you know, that we would like have dinner and watch like Conan the Barbarian, you know, and like Grace Jones. I didn't even remember Grace Jones was in the film how, what is that, right? And she's like totally submissive to this fool and like, you know, and she's kicking ass. Like, it's just like this, this, so I just am like going through all this, like, like, um, yeah. And so it's just, it was just kind of a way actually to get it out of my body. And, and like, like ex an acceptance of like what is so I could move past it and like try to raise my child with as little fear as possible. Yeah, for me, it was, um, it's such an interesting question because you know, when you start with uh, this idea, so it was very intellectual and then it just completely shifted. So, you know, I started with um, that, um, the arc choir um, song, Jesus Walks, you know, which Kanye um, uses. So I started with that and then it just, you know, it just, I don't know, it just changed. And then I asked my older daughter who was like hanging out in her bedroom. I was like, I need you, I need you to like keep walking up and down with these shoes on. She was like, okay, <laughs> this is Mia. And um, she was just, and so for me, like the, the bodily aspect of it was like when I got out of my head and I could get into my body, it was interesting because, because she came from my body. So when I see it and then I think about, you know, when I was her age and going to, you know, clubs three nights a week, that's really what the story is about in the end. It's really about, these are the people that I saw when I was on the street. There was no like dandy, esthete walking around like oh you know it, there were people who were like you know like I say there's like we're broken bodies and people who are in the wrong body or you know however they're describing it um and queer and sex workers and you know drug users it was just different it wasn't the way that Benjamin and Baudelaire were describing it and so um so it did you know it definitely felt like there was this um, like to have Mia be the one who's the flaneur nurse was very, um, yeah, like a very powerful feeling in my body. And I still feel that like every time I see the walk, you know. We've got a few comments in the, in the chat. Um, Carol says, I was, I'm always reminded of talking about the archive of the words of W.B. 
Du Bois, du Bois who stated that unless we create our own archives and others will take the terms by which we are remembered. Absolutely. Thanks, Carol, for st sticking in here. Che, who is um, one of the filmmakers from today said, thank you for this wonderful conversation around the work, very generative. I'm thinking about the connections between grief, representation and healing. And yes, the quote that you mentioned is fact is simply fiction and also state power to maintain the fidelity to a certain set of archival limits. So great, Stia. <laughs> Thanks for putting that in the chat, Che. Um, she said this at the Hammer Museum. Um, are we going to be consigned forever to tell the same kinds of stories given the violence and power that has engendered this limit? Why should I be faithful to that limit? Why? Yeah, yeah. Why? exactly. Yeah, exactly. This why? really is why the speculation was necessary. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Why should I respect that? That's how I feel about so many yeah. things. Right? Thanks, Che, for that. Yeah. Thank you. A serious, I feel that way all the time. <laughs> why, why would I respect that? Why am I, you yeah. know? What law? No. No. And then no, it, you're kidding me. Then we come back to like policing, right? Where, you know, there's this ridiculous law in, in Minnesota that you can't have a certain amount of, you know, you have a restriction on your air fresheners in your car. Like, what? what? You know, this is why we can't, you know, these are just like made up laws to, to you know, and confine us. Yeah, uh, they're pig laws. They're like constant pig laws. Yeah. They're just over and over again. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And the same stories too. And like the, you know, just, um, like what puts us in a constant state of reacting. Mm. In my mind <laughs> <laughs> what puts it, you know like so we can't we can't rest right. we can't dream we can't vote we can't <laughs> vote we can't we can't do anything right we can't we, i mean it, it's all very uh you know there's a purpose yeah the fact that we can't dream that we can't rest is like it's huge to me it's the it's like the biggest thing mm -hmm. yeah it prevents so much it's it, it it puts us in a it puts us in a constant state of reacting yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so deep the night um that i that i guess it was probably the night that it happened but the night that i heard of the about the makaya bryant murder and the same day as the George uh, the Derek Chauvin verdict mm -hmm. um, I was on the verge of a panic attack it was mad late couldn't sleep and I was like what is wrong with me and I was like oh duh like everything <laughs> with me everything yeah. uh, but I had this moment where I was like this whole thing in the way that it is being presented and circulated is is happening to rob me of my access to wellness like that is literally the plot mm -hmm. and you know because i got you know Saidia hartman whispering in my ear and Hortense spiller somewhere else in a whole <laughs> bevy of black feminists and my mama praying on the phone literally <laughs> right i had to have a moment of being like i I can't go there. Like I have to like call myself back together because this moment, this thing is designed to make me reactive, to steal my access to well-being, to keep me up all night. And that is different than the than the disorientation of grief. Like that is that is how grief is like perverted into like frenzied action. Um, and I really just had to have like a deep, like kind of like metaphysical moment of being like, all right, you're going to breathe. <laughs> you're going to come back here right now. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna play this meditation and you're going to take your ass to sleep. But it was so slippery. Like it was so, so eerie to feel myself almost respect that, right? Almost like give that all my attention, that story, mm -hmm. the narrative, those limits, that fact, right? you know, like to almost like 
just resign to it and let it spiral me all the way to wherever I was finna go. Right. Um, and I to like conscientiously, and I'm probably still there actually. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm trying to too, like, you can feel the vibration, the frequency in your body when things like that happen, like we're collectively like mm-hmm. reacting. It's so wild. Mm-hmm. It's you, so wild. You know, one thing since the pandemic, my family has this like group text. I know a lot of families have that now, right? Like that's like actually a positive thing. Mm-hmm. But my, um, one of the, in the, you know, what you were saying about your mom praying on the phone, literally, like that's the, you know, like when these things, like someone just like puts like a prayer in the text, like, you know, like the, the we're sending our, you know, love to send, to send whoever home, mm-hmm. right? Send so yeah I mean I think that's like you know and there's always like like something in that prayer that's like you know when we sleep tonight like that we're going to sleep like and that we you know that that we're sending like this person to this space Mm -hmm. and I you know and I think that's also just like all I have to do is stay black and die like that right right like that, that kind of, um, that, uh, um, that faith or that spirit, right. Of collectively, like at the same time, your mom's praying on phone, my family's yeah. praying, you know, like this stuff is happening. Like we're like, um, you know, and it doesn't matter who you pray to <laughs> what you're, pray- you know, like that, that, that is, that is like a collective, um, movement Mm -hmm. and that I think is is like how we can count it right like how we can what was would your partner say about like changing death about like Mm -hmm. using I forget now but uh, um, embracing death to reconstruct the world right like that's that's like that is that you know and that that we have to but but we have to all we have to do it collectively yeah yeah and whether it's meditating or you know yeah meditating praying it's all the same rituals spells all of it it's all the same astrology all of it's the same like we we just have to remember like it's it's just that breath like we're all you know, and that, and that like collective dream. Mm. I think that's a good place to, um, we, start, we started with breath. So we end up... <laughs> yeah. It's a good yeah. place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah, I'm going to do that too. <laughs> it's, it's good. It does. It makes a difference. <laughs> This is such Thank a genuine conversation, so beautiful and so powerful and so what I think we all needed, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Ramalaika. Thank you both so much. So great. And thank you to Christopher Harris, to Keisha Ray Witherspoon, to Che Applewaite, and to Gab and Lydia and Mark from 2727. Um, much. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry about the <laughs> Thank you so much to old friends and new friends for joining the program today. Please keep in touch and look out for the forthcoming book, uh, Alicia B. Wormsley's book, There Are Black People in the Future, which I'm so excited. Um, yeah, it's just this has just been a really, okay. really generative conversation. Um, I think, you know, hug your love. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Is that my friend? Sorry, I thought I was muted. <laughs> Come on, Shepard. Hi. Can I say hi? How are you? Hey. How's it going? Can you say hi? Hi. Hi, love. Hi. Yeah. You good? Yeah. yeah. Good. That is the perfect ending. Thank yeah. you so much. That's how the film ends too. Oh, cool. Exactly. Oh, wow. okay. Okay. So, so great to see you, Shepard. So great to see you, Alicia and Malaika. And hug your loved ones really tight. 
take care and let's really start to think about how do we begin to create communities of care in our interior and our in exterior landscapes. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And you Good too. night. Ciao. Bye. Alrighty.